Okay. I'm also going to send you a text if you could look for that. If you're joining us, uh, we're just getting set up um, on Facebook Live and Zoom for our 810 performance of Gay Pilgrim, Theater Rhinoceros. Tonight's free presentation is available at 810, so tune back in at 810 for Gay Pilgrim tonight. This is just a technical rehearsal. Let's see. Hello, Christine. Hey. Hello. Oh, okay, great. So um, do we want to just try to transition to see what our uh, things are going to be? Sure. Okay, so um, let's all go off video and mute. And um, let's, uh, let's go off video and mic. And let's go from the second lobby card. Joe, just take it on your own cue to go into... Hello, hi, how are you? If you're tuning in, we have a show at 8.10. So come back for Gay Pilgrim at 8.10 tonight. This is just a technical rehearsal. Okay, guys, great. I didn't see any um, anything. Let me just see. And there I get what I want. Great, okay, good. So, um, so Joe, Yes. Um, just look at this and tell me you got it. I'm just sending you a text related to the earlier matter. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, okay, great. So Christine, thank you. Uh, I remember our protocols, if we hear anything to reach out to each other or if I do this, okay? Okay. Up. You got my uh, text? I got it. Okay, thank you. So I am going off um, mic and off video and I will see you in a little bit. Test, test, test. This still sounds good? Everything's good. Test, 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 test. Good? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Then I will go off.
Hey, Joe. Hey there. Hey, can we just test my sound really quick? Okay. Um, I'm just going to bring it up here. Here we go. And let's see. Good. Test, test. Sounds good. Okay. Test, test. Sounds good. Okay. Test, test. And sounds good. Okay, great. Thank you. And the picture's good? Picture's great. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be starting in just a few minutes, but thank you for being here for Gay Pilgrim. Yay!
Hello, I'm John Fisher and this is Gay Pilgrim. Okay, now you have to help me out again tonight. Tonight I'm gonna need some sounds, okay? You've done this with me before, okay? I need lots and lots of sounds. This is a very cold play. It's about coldness and wind and stuff. So let's start with something easy. Let's just start with wind. Okay, so do this at home. Okay, go on. No, come on, come on, come on. Do it with your pod, whoever you're with, be it a pet or a person or yourself, do it with your pod. Here we go. Whoosh, do it for me. Yeah, 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 I heard that. I'm hearing that. That's good, 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 good. Now, like a high, a high pitched wind, like right? the wind that cuts through anything, even down jackets. Whoosh, give it to me, give it to me. Good, good. No, I heard that. I heard that. Yeah, give it. Like almost a whistle. That's great. And then like uh, thunder bolts, uh, thunder, thunder claps. I heard some of those, a little quiet, louder, louder. Yeah, good, those are good. And finally, rain. Yeah, if the, if the gesture helps, do that, yeah. yeah. Great, that's terrific. Okay, so I'm going to start you on the sounds, and then I'm going to go away for a second, but keep the sounds coming, right? Because they're going to set up the scene for us, okay? Okay, so here we go. So I'm going to start you on the sounds, okay? So start um, the wind. Yeah, that's it. Keep it up, keep it up, keep up the wind. And some high-pitched wind. Give us some high pitch. That's good. I hear that. I hear that. And then storm. That's great, that's great, you're doing really well. The sea is rough, it's rough, it's rough on us. Oh, sir, sir, will we ever make it? I feel like we're about to pound us all to sink. I, I, I will never sink. This is the Mayflower. She won't sink. This is nothing. This isn't even a scrawl. It's a drizzle. I feel like we're going to sink, sir. Nay, nay. Just a couple more days and we'll be in the new world. We'll be in Virginia. Give me the strong, give me the strong. Yeah, good group, good group. But I feel, I feel we're going to sink, sir. Nah, nah, don't worry about it, Jeremiah. We won't to sink. Not the Mayflower, she's sturdy. In two days we'll be in Virginia. Soon we'll see a sparrow, a dove of peace, clutching a twig in her beak. That'll be the sign that shore is near. <laughs> Give it to me, give it to me. And I miss you, babe, like the deserts miss the rain. And I miss you, babe, like the deserts miss the rain. Remember that song? Yeah. I listened to that song every night for two years in San Francisco. Yep, every single night. I've been working steadily for two years as a director, a playwright, and an actor. I'd had four shows play one after the other. It was incredible, it was great. And every night, the last song in the pre-show was, and I miss you, babe, like the deserts miss the rain. And when that song was over, I went on stage. It was terrific. It was a two year run. I couldn't believe it. It was great. The last theater we played in was for nine months and it was a 550 seat theater. I was so proud. And then I got a week off, a week off in January. And then I have to come back and go into a whole nother set of plays. I was excited, but I needed that week off desperately. So I decided that I would go to Boston. Yeah, I'd go to Boston. I'd see my brother and his wife. It'd be so great. So I called them up. I said, I'm coming to Boston for a week. They said, great, call us when you get here. We'll get together, we'll do fun stuff. It'll be great to see you. Yay, wonderful. You see, I had to get away. I had to get away. But there was a big problem because my husband and I, Michael, lovely Michael, 
we loved to travel together, but he hadn't been able to travel for two years with me. He had to go off on trips on his own because I couldn't leave town because of these plays. And now I wanted to take a week off and he couldn't get the time off because it was too spontaneous. It was all right, he understood. And I said, I'll call you every night and I'll stay in touch. And if I ever get lonely, which will be constantly, I'll call you and I'll bug you, I'll bug you at work. It'll be great. I'll call you up at work and we'll talk. We'll connect. I said, it'll be fine. You see, I had to get out of SF. I had to get out of San Francisco for a week. I was gayed out. I was just like gay, 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 gay. I mean, it, and it, it, you know, it wasn't just the city, it was me. I mean, I was like uber gay. I mean, my shows were just gay, 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 gay. Musical, play, comedies, gay, 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 gay. So I was just gayed out in San Francisco. So I decided anything, anything. I would go and check out another gay scene. I check out more gay theater. I go to Boston and check that out. But more than anything, I wanted to check out the history. Boston had it all. It's where it all started. The Pilgrims, the American Revolution, the Kennedys, it was all there. And I was so excited to catch up with all that history. So I went to the airport, to SFO, and I got on a plane. So now help me out with the, um, with the jet engines, okay? You've done this before, okay? So we're gonna get onto a, uh, uh, onto a jet plane, but that's, that's like a car, right? Okay, no, this, not, now I'm buckled in. Okay, so here we go. So give me the jet engines. Yeah, hear them. Okay, 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 okay. okay, now get louder. Come on, pods. Come on, pods. Come on, pods. That's great. Remember, pod backwards is dope. You guys are dope. This is great. Give me the engines. And now louder for takeoff, my favorite part. I was airborne to Boston, and in no time at all, I was gonna land. So let's do the landing. And now we're gonna have the wheels skid on the tarmac. Okay, so here we go. It was wonderful. They didn't use a jetway in Boston. They just wheeled one of the stairways up to us and the door opened. I stepped outside. I stepped outside into Boston and it was freezing. It was so cold. I couldn't believe it. I've been all over the East Coast in the winter and it was nothing like this. Boston was freezing. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I didn't expect summer vacation. I didn't expect Hawaii or anything, but this was outrageous. It was like Antarctica and this, this blasting wind. Shh, give it to me. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It was blasting into me. So I got all bundled up in my winter gear and I headed for the T, which is their subway, which actually goes to the airport. I got on the T and the T was cold too. It was freezing. And then I got to Copley Square. That's where my hotel was, the Copley Square Hotel. I was so excited. And I came above ground and <laughs> the wind was outrageous. Give it to me. <laughs> Barely make any headway. Shh, shh, shh. Boston was incredible. There was nobody on the sidewalk. It was an empty city. It was like post nukes, and it was all wind, and it was freezing. Shh, give it to me. Give it to me. Shh, shh. And I walked into the Copley Square Hotel. I just barely made it. Shh. Oh my God. Oh my Lord, I was freezing, but the hotel was beautiful. I immediately saw that. And it was named after John Singleton Copley, that great Revolutionary War era painter. And they had two of his paintings in this hotel right over the front desk. So I walked up and I checked in. And when they all checked me in and gave me my, my key card, uh, I said, uh, is there a restaurant in the hotel? I'm starving, I need some comfort food to heat me up. They said, no, sir, I'm afraid there isn't. I said, is there like a, a restaurant connected to the hotel that I could get to easily? No, sir, I'm afraid not. But there's a great restaurant nearby. It's called Station 54. It's got comfort food. Oh, I said, how far away is that? They said, it's only two blocks away on Newbury Street. Two blocks? I freeze. They said, sir, it'll be fine. Just zip all the way up and go to it. You'll love it when you get there. So I went out into the wilderness of Boston. Shh, shh, shh. Give me the wind, give me the wind. Shh. I couldn't believe it. The streets were abandoned. It was just wind and cold. It was freezing. I was slipping on the ice. It was horrifying. And finally, I stumbled into Station 54. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I made it. I stumbled over to a table and I sat down. Oh, 
I was exhausted. I ordered what everybody else was eating. Spare ribs covered with barbecue sauce and french fries doused in ketchup. Comfort food, heart attack food, just what I needed to warm up. And also everybody was drinking these huge steins of beer and this beer was dark, it was like black. It was like sludge beer, like mud, like liquid poo, this beer. That's what you needed. That's what you need to warm up. So I did what everybody else did. I pigged out on my ribs. <coughs> pig out, make pig sounds. Oink, yeah. <coughs> yeah, you can do it. Yeah, good, good, good. <coughs> and then I picked out on the fries. <coughs> Help me, pig, 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 pig. That's what I heard all around me. It's just picking out. That's the Bostonians. <coughs> and then I drank that huge beer. I needed the warm drink. And then I had a big belch. Yeah, do that for me. Good. Uh, some of those sound like burps. Burps are drier. Belches are wet. Think wet. Yeah, good. It's beginning to sound like Station 54 on Newbury Street in Boston. Good. Oh, finally, I warmed up. It was the first time I was warm in Boston. So I got my guidebook, the Access Guide to Boston. I wanted to check out local theater. I'd love to go to theater in other cities, see what the gay stuff is, see what the theaters look like, check out the theater scene. And the theater they recommended in here was the Wang Center for the Performing Arts. I thought, wow, that's great. They went on and on about it. They said it was the most beautiful building, incredible. It was built in the early 20th century, and this guy, Mr. Wang, totally restored it in 1982. They said, buy a ticket, see a show. The interior of this theater is worth the price of admission. Any show, just go there and see it. So I braced myself and I headed out into Boston. <laughs> shh, 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 give me the wind. Shh, it's incredible. <laughs> Don't on the ice. <laughs> there was nobody, nobody in this whole city. I didn't see anybody. It was incredible. Oh, oh, I made inside. I made inside the Wang Center for the Performing Arts box office. I was overwhelmed by the cold. But I walked right up to the box office. I said, hey, hi, um, I really just want to see the interior, like the lobby and the auditorium. Can I just go in and take a peek? They said, sir, you have to buy a ticket. You can't go in unless you have a ticket. Oh, okay. Well, uh, the guidebook said it's worth the price of admission, so I'll buy a ticket. Uh, what's playing tonight? I didn't really check. Sir, Riverdance is playing. Riverdance. Oh, I don't know anything about that. Is that like s swimming, dancing, like dancing underwater, you know, like fish dance, that kind of thing? Sir, Riverdance is an international phenomenon. Don't you watch television? Oh, <laughs> of course I watch TV. <laughs> I just watch gay stuff, unfortunately. And I guess Riverdance isn't gay. Anyway, um, no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, how much are tickets? Uh-huh. Really? For one? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, well, I'm on vacation. Why not? Here you go. <laughs> Thanks. I'm excited. So I went into the lobby of the Wang Center for the Performing Arts. <gasps> It was incredible. Give me some, uh, some heavenly music, ethereal, like angels. Oh, yeah, that's it, that's it, keep it coming. Oh, oh, it was amazing. It was the most beautiful interior I'd seen in the United States anywhere. It was incredible. It was five stories tall. All this red damask and green, sumptuous green, emerald green carpets and these huge, Fluted columns rising up five stories and sprouting, capped with incredible Corinthian capitals. It was amazing. And the ceiling, the ceiling was the best part. This massive fresco, a depiction of heaven. Give me the heavenly voices. Oh, I couldn't believe it. Five stories above me. And heaven was full, of course, of little pooty. You know, those little, those little babies, those little white babies with their butts hanging out. Their butts are always like hanging out. Or their little peepees. It's always like butts and peepees. It was like, this must have been designed by somebody gay. It's just like pooty everywhere, like butts, peepees. But little baby butts and peepees. Pooty, pooty, pooty. It was incredible. And then something happened. I was, I was, I was floored. It was the most wonderful thing and I never expected it to happen. I mean, I should have, but I didn't. There was an announcement and the announcement went like this. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the Wang Center for the Performing Arts. 
Oh my God, it was a Boston accent. I loved it. The Wang Center for the Performing Arts. It was perfect. I love accents. That's the best thing about travel is you arrive at the airport and immediately start hearing all these accents, like English accents or French accents or Russians or, or the best are Germans. Oh my God, it's terrifying. You're saying, oh my God, I'm in Germany. It's horrifying. Those Teutonic accents always like at each other. It's great. But I completely forgot that Boston has an accent. And there it was performing acts. I loved it. I was in heaven. It was like John F. Kennedy was on the PA system. I was so proud of myself for coming to the Wang Center for the Performing Arts. Please take your seats for the performance. It was great. So I went in and the lobby was one thing, but the auditorium was amazing. It was all red and gold red seats, gold, the ceiling was another huge fresco full of booty. And then in front of me was this massive proscenium. And that was topped by booty at the center. And again, they had the little butts hanging out, the little peepees, it was so cute. And I sat in the second row, because the guidebook had said the acoustics aren't so good if you sit too far back, sit close. I sat in the second row and this huge red curtain shot up. And there in front of me, I couldn't even believe it, arrayed aligned like an army ready to attack from proscenium to proscenium, 70 dancers all dressed as Irish people. And they immediately started doing this. Here, here, you have to do the clicking for me. I need clicking sound, okay? Okay, so here we go with the clicking. They did that for two hours. Keep up the clicking. It was incredible. It went on for two hours and the audience loved it. It was all about step dancing. Like, and then they explored step dancing around the world, like in Holland and in the United States and in Scotland. But it always got back how great Ireland, Ireland was and how it was the natural birthplace of the step dancing. It was amazing. And I swear to God, it all looked like fascism to me. It was like goose stepping. I mean, look at these arrays of dancers just doing this for two hours. <laughs> like watching an army march. And the audience loved it. They were cheering. I felt like I was at the Nuremberg rally. It was, I, I mean, I felt like if somebody came out and instructed all of us to invade Canada, we would have just said, ah, see, Kyle! And, you know, step danced off to Canada. <laughs> on a huge invasion. It was horrifying. But the Bostonians loved it. And at intermission, the intercom said, you can now buy tickets for the next visit of Riverdance in six months. And the woman in front of me stood up and she said, I know where I want to be in six months. Let's go get those tickets. And they ran to the box office. It was amazing. <laughs> okay, so when I got over my horror of that audience and what I saw on stage, I mean, it was very moving and very effective in all the wrong ways. I headed back out into the night. It was time to go home and rest after my big trip and my adventure to the Wang Center. And I knew I'd be cold. So I figured what I'd do was sing to myself as I walked home, because I was missing Michael. I missed him so much. So I walked home through the cold. Give me a low wind. Yeah, that's good. And I miss you, babe. Like the deserts miss the rain. And I miss you. Babe, like the deserts miss the rain. Take a hand at it. Would you buy? You've got a good swing there, boy. Thanks. Where'd you get here, young man? Last year, sir. I'm indentured to uh, Thomas Wenmore, your neighbor, sir. Uh, as soon as I've finished my servitude, I, I, I want to buy land here. How long have you been here, sir? Me? <laughs> uh, 
I've been here 17 years, son. I came over on the Mayflower, 1620. You did? Huh. Whoa. Oh. Hey, what's that there you're doing, boy? What's that? Oh, that's just a jig, sir. My parents taught it to me. I just do it when I want to stay warm in the cold air. <laughs> you're a step dancer, boy. A step dancer. There's Irish in you yet. Come over here. Now, put your hands on your hips properly and let's do it together. That's it. That's it. Dance with me, boy. Dance with me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't sound like a Puritan, sir. I'm not. I'm not Puritan. And everyone on the Mayflower was a Puritan boy. The next morning, I got up early and I called my brother. There was no answer. So I left him a message. I decided, since we weren't going to get together that day, I hadn't heard from him, that I would begin my historic tour. I would tour all the history sites beginning today. So I went and I rented a car because I had needed to head out onto Cape Cod. Yes, that's right. I was headed to Plymouth to see the spot where the Mayflower landed. Yes, to New Plymouth. Now, you're gonna have to help me out with the car, okay? So I need some car sounds, okay? So, okay, okay, I'm all buckled in. And uh, so let's start it up. Yeah, that's a little bit, that's like a bottle of tea, right? No, no, something modern, okay, but give it for me. Okay, here we go, and that's good, that, that's good, I hear some great cars. That's good, that's good. And you can also do wind, yeah, because it was still raining, right? And it was still windy. It was incredibly windy still. Okay, so here we go, and I'm headed out on the Cape Cod. Keep the car up, and I'm on Highway 3, headed to Cape Cod. So naturally, I sang my favorite Cape Cod song, Billy Joel's Down Easter Alexa. So I'm on the Down Easter Alexa. And I'm cruising through Block Island Sound. I have charted a course for the vineyard, but tonight I am Nantucket bound. I was headed to Cape Cod, steeped in history. At the end of Cape Cod, keep the motor coming. Yeah, that's it. At the end of Cape Cod was Provincetown, where all the gay people went. The big gay spot on the East Coast in the summer. And also Cape Cod's where Jaws was filmed. And Martha's Vineyard is where Chappaquiddick is. Yeah, that's where the Kennedys came out, hang out. And that's where Teddy Kennedy came to grief when he let that poor girl drown in the Chappaquiddick River. And also Nantucket, the island of Nantucket. That's where all of the whaling industry got started. This was great. You know, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, they tried to secede from Massachusetts in the 70s. Yeah, they wanted to become their own state or attach themselves to another state. One state that offered to help was Maine, another was Hawaii. Can you believe that? They were gonna become Hawaiian islands, but it didn't happen. Oh my God, there it is in front of me. Plymouth Rock. I turned off for Plymouth Rock and I stopped. Pulled up the brake. I heard a good break. Good, good, good. Keep with me. Yeah, yeah. I got out. Oh my God, it was cold again. It was cold. Give me the wind. Give me the wind. Shh. And there I stood in a little colonnade looking down at Plymouth Rock. That's just what it is. It's a rock. It's not even that big. And written on it is 1620, which is the year that the Mayflower full of pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock. Why is it called Plymouth Rock? Because they came from Plymouth in the west of England. But that's not originally where they fled to. They didn't originally flee to the New World. Originally, the Puritans were being persecuted at the beginning of the 17th century. You see, James I had a very difficult religious situation in England, and he wanted to suppress all extremist sects, and the Puritans were definitely that. So they weren't getting much love from James I. Also, they were freeholders. They weren't rich people, and the rich were beginning to dominate. The rise of the rich the rich landholders and the rise of autocracy all over Europe, in France and Spain, even in Germany, and now with James I in England. So they had to flee this powerful, oppressive king. 
their first choice was to go to Holland. Yeah, liberal Holland, Protestant Holland. Holland said, yeah, come on, come on, join us. Come and hang out with the Dutch. Well, they were very welcoming, but the um, pilgrims, the uh, Puritans didn't really fit in. They couldn't join the Dutch unions. They couldn't get enough work. And then it looked like Holland was going to go to war with Spain. And they didn't want to be there for a war. They didn't want to get involved in a war, have to fight for the Dutch. So they went back to England, back to Plymouth. Now in Plymouth, they contracted for a ship to take them to the New World. Well, the first ship was too leaky, so they had to get another ship. That was the Mayflower. The Mayflower, that beautiful vessel. Unfortunately, the Mayflower was too big. There weren't enough Puritans to fill the Mayflower, so they had to take on other English people, West County people, to fill the Mayflower. And that was the contingent. That was the load. And it struck out across the North Atlantic in rough weather, in winter, in Incredible. And they were headed originally for Virginia. <laughs> Across the Atlantic with storms, through wind and rain, it was outrageous, it was such a journey. And before they got there, they came up with a contract between the Puritans and the non-Puritans. And it's considered one of the first, maybe the first, constitution in the United States, an agreement on how they would behave. Now, they were headed towards Virginia because there was actually a colony in Virginia. So that's where they wanted to go, Virginia but they got blown off course, blown way off course, and they ended up in Massachusetts where there was no colony at Plymouth Rock, and that's where they dropped anchor in 1620, and that's where they created their new colony, a brand new colony by accident. I was standing there looking at Plymouth Rock, so majestic, and then I looked to the right, and there was the recreation of the Mayflower, the Mayflower too. It was spectacular, with that huge stern and those sloping decks like a Spanish galleon, so noble, and that wonderful paint job. I was like, wow, I'm here. This is where it all started. Pilgrims, Mayflower, Puritans. And then I wondered, but where do I fit into all this? I always wonder that. Where, where does somebody like me fit into this picture that I've discovered? This is so wonderful, but where am I in it? I must be here. Me. I must be here. So I wanted to find out. I wanted to find proof that a person like me was actually there in 1620 with the pilgrims, with the Mayflower. So I drove back to Boston. Give me the car. No, that's the uh, nicer car. Yeah, that's it. I'm on the down Easter Electra, and I'm da da da. And I got to Boston. I returned the car. I was back in the wind. She was so cold. There was nobody on the sidewalk. The city is empty. And I walked into it. My goal. My goal to do research. The Boston Public Library. It was amazing. The lobby, the staircases had these incredible murals over them. It was heavenly. Give me the heavenly sound again. Oh, that's it, that's it, keep going. Oh, oh, oh. And the artist was one of my favorite, John Singer Sargent. He is incredible. He can do anything, realism, symbolism, impressionism. He was so adept at everything. And this was one of his masterpieces, this huge fresco cycle called the triumph of religion, but there were no pooty, there were no, no butts and peepees, there was none of that stuff. It was all very, very serious and beautifully rendered. I just stood there staring up at it. Oh, I couldn't believe its beauty. And then my eyes fell on the most horrifying thing I'd ever seen. John Singer Sargent's depiction of hell. I've never seen anything more horrible. I wanted to weep, I was so afraid. The fresco was full of writhing dead bodies. They had no blood in them. They were white, white and blue, and they were all writhing in hell, these souls writhing and surrounding them. Slithering through them, you could see glimpses of the devil whose body was all blue. You could see an arm, a leg, a foot, and he was slithering about them, consuming them, eating up their souls, and the pain on the faces of these souls, and his mouth was huge with these huge incisors. And his mouth was full of these pale bodies, these souls lost in hell, and he was eating them. It was horrifying. So I stumbled into the reading room, 
And I went to the card catalog and I looked up a book. I found the book, the book I wanted. And I walked up to the paging desk and I requested this book. It was a very specific book that I wanted. And they brought it to me. They brought it to me. And I uh, took it to a table in the reading room, this majestic reading room, so incredible. The interior spaces in that city are amazing. So I sat down with this book, which would tell me about me and where I fit in to Plymouth Rock and the arrival of the pilgrims. And I read the story of two men, two men in 1637. Oh, Mr. Hitton, Mr. Hitton, Jeremiah, call me Jeremiah, please. I, I, I came because I, I want, I wanted to suck you. Didn't see you. I, I, I wanted to see you, sir. So I, I came. Yes. What did you want to uh, see me about? I, I wanted to know if I could work with you, sir. What does Mr. Wenmore say? I, I didn't tell him, sir. I, I can come at night, sir, when he's asleep. What kind of work are you gonna do at night, son? Eh? Well, I, I can, uh, I can owe, I can, uh, I can plow. I, I can, I can slot pigs. Why? I, I like you. I, I like working with you, sir. I do. <laughs> Have you ever been in love, son? Ever? No, sir. How old are you, son? I'm 23, I think. Come here. <sighs> Next morning, I got up early and I called my brother. Still no answer. So I left him a message and uh, I decided, since I didn't get a hold of him, that today would be the beginning of my art tour. Boston is famous for its museums. The Museum of Fine Arts, the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum. It has lots of museums. I was going to begin my journey at the Fine Arts Museum. It was only four blocks away. That's one of the reasons I chose the hotel I did, because it was so close. So I headed out into the wilderness of Boston. <laughs> Nobody in this city. <laughs> the only thing that hurts is I. <laughs> It is so cold, this city is cold. Yeah. And suddenly I was in the Museum of Fine Arts. Another amazing space. Heavenly. Give me the heaven. Oh, oh. And again, huge frescoes soaring over my head and beside me. And all by John Singer Sargent but not religious this time, nothing religious about them, and certainly no puti with pee, pee and poo poo and all that stuff, no puti. This was all men, men. There was such sensuality in it. It felt so homoerotic. And I went over into a corner, in a corner, in a niche that I don't think anybody ever looked at, was a completely naked man, kneeling with a come hither look on his face. The most beautiful man I'd ever seen in a fresco. It was so homoerotic. This was an aspect of Singer Sargent I had never heard anything about. And then I walked into the main salon, and the paintings were hung salon style, soaring up above each other. And there on the left, I saw one of my favorite paintings, El Greco, the 17th century Greek painter who painted in spade. Oh, his lines were so delicate 
so, so soft, so sensuous, that asshole Ernest Hemingway, he called El Greco Americon, a gay guy because his lines were too soft. Oh, the heck with him. Yeah, okay, maybe he was gay, but if that means great painting, go for it. And they too, in their soft, sensuous way, were completely homoerotic. What a wonderful museum. I went into the Impressionists, they had like a thousand Monets. They had Millets going on forever. And then a triptych that I'd seen dozens of times in books by Gauguin. Polynesians in Tahiti, where he went and painted them. The first panel was called, Where Do We Come From? The second panel, Where Are We Now? The third panel, What Are We? It was so moving, the art in this museum. I went on and on all day long. I couldn't believe it. And there was nobody there. It was empty like the rest of Boston. It was incredible. And then I began to think, though, that all this sensuality, all this homoeroticism, but it wasn't overt. It was very delicate, it was very hidden. And I began to realize that Boston had not shown me a gay side. And when I looked in the guidebook, there was no gay neighborhood, no neighborhood specifically for gays. It was not a gay city. And when I looked it up, the big gay hangout was this huge disco, which was kind of like hidden away, almost kind of closeted in and of itself in its location. And the big attraction there was these, these uh, go-go boys, and they stood on top of speakers, right? And they danced in thongs, like the tiniest thong you've ever seen. And they had these big snakes around their necks. And people walked up and shoved like 20s into their thongs, in all places in their thongs, and they just danced on these speakers. And if you gave them a good enough tip, the snake would go, and thank you. This is gay, this is gay life, thongs and snakes. I was like, what's going on in this city? The only gayness I see is like this sort of closety stuff, this, 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 this stuff in the art museum or stuff I read in books at the Boston Public Library. It's the only gay things I'm finding. And I thought, why? Because this is such a liberal city. This is a home of American liberalism. This is where the Kennedys come from. Yeah, but then I thought, you know what? The Kennedys are kind of that that kind of macho liberalism, you know, that really tough guy, Irish liberalism, you know, let's be liberal presidents, but uh, let's bring uh, Marilyn in the White House so Bobby and John can have sex with her. Like Bill Clinton, you know, kind of macho, stud, liberal, you know, let's have sex in the White House. Or Teddy Kennedy became that poor woman killed and all those other girlfriends who sabotaged his career. That's the kind of liberals they were. And there wasn't a gay, enough gay presence. It wasn't like my city. It was strange that way. And what about my gay pilgrims? What about the pilgrims I discovered? I wondered what was their legacy? Had they left nothing behind them? Did they have no legacy? What had happened to them? When they found each other, what was the next step? Jeremiah Hinton approached the bench. And who is my accuser, sir? Your accuser is Thomas Wenmore, your neighbor. He saw you. And what about the boy, sir? Don't you want to know what you are accused of, Mr. Hinton? I don't, sir. You've been accused by the colony of... Now, I need you to help out here but not in a campy way, not in an overblown way, just in a real way. I need you to gasp whenever I point. And don't, you know, don't, don't push it. Don't, don't be too much. I'm the king of too much, so I can say this. Just be real. Be like, <gasps> remember, you're a 1637 Puritan, and you've come to this, this trial, and you're hearing this stuff, and it is outrageous to you. So just let's have a practice gasp, okay? Good, good. Yes, yeah, subtle, subtle, subtle. <gasps> yeah, okay, so here we go. Mr. Hinton, you've been accused by the colony of onanism. Oh, yeah, good, good, good. Sodomy. You have been accused of the unlawful spilling of seed. And the boy is not a boy, Mr. Hinton. He'll be accused as well as you. He's not guilty. I seduced him. Can you prove that, Mr. Hinton? Yes. I've done it before. 
Well, I never heard from my brother. I called, left messages, nothing. That was fine. I had plenty to do. My history tour continued. And whenever I got lonely, I just called Michael and I bugged him. I bugged him all the time. He was always trying to get me off the phone because he was at work. He was allowed to talk. I said, I don't care. I'm lonely. Talk to me. So I, uh, I went on the tour, the Freedom Trail tour. The great thing about Boston is they know that everybody's there to see the Revolutionary War sites. So they have this red brick line. It's like follow the yellow brick road, right? All the way through Boston. So you can see all the sites. It's called the Freedom Trail. And it's great. I saw Fanel Hall, the location of the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party in the harbor. I saw the graveyard where the Adamses are buried. Bullfinch's State House from the 19th century. And right next to it, the statue of General Hooker, the Civil War General. Yeah, he was so into the ladies that that's where they got their name from General Hooker. Yeah, he was, you know, that type of lady. Yeah. So his name gave that, yeah, and there he was. Yeah, yeah, General Hooker, right in front of the State House. It was great. And I walked all over Beacon Hill and saw the oxidized windows, the ones that had turned purple. They were so old, hundreds of years old, these windows, and they turned purple. It was so wonderful. And then I got another car. I strapped myself in and I drove out to the old battlefields. Give me the car. I went to Lexington and Concord. And the farmers gave them ball for ball from behind each fence and farmyard wall. Yes, I saw that. I saw that 1774, the Minutemen attacking the British army. I saw it lining the road, the collapsed fences, the collapsed walls, just like they went, they, they, they don't repair them. They're real, they've been sitting there for hundreds of years. They're right there, it was amazing. And I went to Bunker Hill which is actually Breed's Hill, but okay, we call it Bunker Hill with a huge obelisk at the top. And I pretended I was those uh, British grenadiers marching up the hill. I learned about all this from the N.C. Wyeth paintings, incredible. Those proud grenadiers marching up the hill in long lines. And the Minutemen at the top, the Americans mowing them down. <laughs> incredible and then i went to the old north church it was so beautiful one if by land and two if by sea and i on the opposite shore will be ready to ride and to spread the alarm to every middlesex village and farm i went to the constitution the uss constitution the hero battleship of the war of 1812 it was amazing it was so beautiful old iron sides they caught because the british cannonballs <laughs> bounced off of it. It was made of wood, but it felt like iron. Amazing. All this amazing history. I was in ecstasy. And finally, on a sunny Sunday afternoon, the Bostonians came out. Those sensual, passionate people that Henry James had written that great novel about, the Bostonians. There they were in the sunshine on Marlborough Street. Newbury Street, Commonwealth, they came out in force. People, here there were people. There were in fact people in Boston. <laughs> I was so happy to see them and the weather got a little bit warmer. Jeremiah Hinton. You have been found guilty of the crime of onanism. Your sentence is that you are to be conveyed from this place to your place of punishment. There you will be whipped until blood is drawn, branded so that wherever you may go, all will know of your heinous crime and banished in perpetuity from this colony. And if you return, you will be whipped out of the colony. The young man, we have been convinced that you were seduced, led astray, that you are the innocent party. Nevertheless, you did participate. You are to be whipped, returned to servitude, and never permitted to own land in this colony. So I came to this colony. I'm an indentured servant. My dream 
is to own land, sir, I'm sorry. That is your punishment, never to own land. You also witness the whipping of Mr. Whitten. All right, take him away. Now, I need you to make whipping sounds when I point to you, when we start. If the gesture helps, do it. Do I have to watch? Whipping sounds. And now I need to, you to make the sound of a brand, okay? A brand touching flesh when I point to you. Can I help him? <laughs> Where will you go? Where will you go now you're banished? Somewhere. I'll go somewhere. I will. And that's what I discovered in the Boston Public Library. The fate of the people like me in Plymouth in 1637. On my last day, I went to the other great museum in Boston, the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum. I was excited. I'd read so much good stuff about it. The guidebook went on and on about it. It ranked up there with the Museum of Fine Arts, the Boston Public Library, the Wang Center for the Performing Arts. So I was excited. I still had to babble the cold. It was still so cold. But there were some people out, some, some. And I actually saw a line when I got to the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum and I stood in it. It was so cold. Give me a little wind. Not the, not the, yeah. Yeah, that's what's going on. And finally I got inside and it was, it was dreary. It was weird. It wasn't wonderful. The paintings were all muddy. Paintings by famous people, but not the best quality and not clean. And many of the paintings have been stolen, so all that there was to see was like an empty frame and a weird little three by five card with a badly typed explanation of the robbery. It was incredible. It wasn't at all the magical place that had been described. It was like a sad place. There was only one great painting, a painting full of sensuality, passion, sex, and it was huge and colorful. And of course, it was the only painting in that museum by John Singer Sargent. And there it was, all the sex, all the energy of a great, great artist. The rest of it, sad, weird, strange the Gardner Museum. And when the sun went down that day, the people went away. They all disappeared, vanished. Vanished. They weren't like Henry James's sensual, intelligent, passionate people. They weren't that way at all. The Bostonians, like my brother, Absent, banished in this strange, cold city. I was used to bustling and, and New York City and Washington, D.C. in the winter, where the sidewalks are full of people all excited, day, night, rain, snow, wind. Everybody loves to be out shopping and going to shows, eating, having fun, enjoying themselves, bumping into each other, day or night. Not here, not here. Here was only wind 
and little joy. And I investigated what happened to my, my two men. The young one was allowed to buy property. He was whipped. He had to finish his servitude, but he became a good citizen, a citizen of note. And he was eventually allowed to buy property. And when you consider that, according to the law, the rule of the law, they could have been killed for their crime, in a way, the Puritans were generous. They let them live. But the other one, Jeremiah, he'd been exiled, banished. And in America, then there was no place to go. There was the wilderness. He was cast off in the wilderness. In ancient Greece, when you were banished, you died because nobody wanted you. And remember, he was branded. He was branded for his crime as an onanist. He wouldn't be accepted anywhere. So he just disappears from the history. There's no follow-up to his story. But I like to imagine that he was like Natty Bumpo, that character from the last of the Mohicans. And that he went out and he lived amongst the indigenous peoples, the Mohawks, the Delawares, and that he threw tomahawks, boom, shot arrows, choo, 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 fought. <laughs> Rode a horse. That's what I want him to be, Natty Bumpo. And I'd like to think that he found love amongst the indigenous peoples, amongst the Delawares, the Mohawks, that even they, even they had a more enlightened attitude towards him and who he was than the Puritans. That's what I wish for Jeremiah, that he went out, <laughs> lived as a Delaware, and found what they call the two-spirit, the two-spirited indigenous person, found love, and made a life for himself where people didn't care about stupid things like that. Thank you so much for joining me for Gay Pilgrim. Um, those two guys, it's a real story. Um, uh, what's really uh, survived is the court transcript, the court record. So they were found with each other. They were accused of spilling their seed. Those were the sentences, the whipping, the branding. Uh, the young one wasn't allowed to own property, although that was his dream, his whole reason for coming to America. And uh, the older one was just banished. And so I gave him the, the James Fenimore Cooper ending. But it's a true story from 1637. And I like to think of it as the beginnings of gayness. And that he went out there and he made gay okay, even back in 1637. Thank you so much for joining me tonight for my Thanksgiving presentation about gay pilgrims, the Mayflower and the Puritans coming here. I do like to find myself everywhere in history, and I think that that's important. If you'd like to make a donation to our theater to support this free programming, and these are free shows, and a lot of the stuff we do at this point is free. We've put on over 50 Zoom productions since the onset of COVID-19. This is my 37th, I think, uh, essential service project. So if you'd like to support this, uh, this free programming, we can certainly use your help. You can make a donation, send me a check at my COVID-19 office, John Fisher, Theater Rhinoceros, 91 Central Avenue, number 102, San Francisco, California, 94117, or go on our website, therhino.org, and make a donation. We'd certainly appreciate your support. Coming up next in December, December 11th, Alligator Mouth Tadpole Ass, which is the second in our subscription season. You can still subscribe online. We started with Overlook Latinas, and now we have the COVID Safe coming to you on Zoom in a very elaborate, I think it's gonna be a beautiful production. I've seen the set design, and the actors are in San Francisco and Kansas City, two actors, and the set is like a room created, the two ends of the room created in two completely different cities, as if these guys are in the same space. I think it's gonna be a wonderful play. It's a beautiful play by J. Julian Christopher, a great Latinx comedy drama. And also the Essential Services Projects continues. Today was Wednesday because uh, Thanksgiving's tomorrow, but we'll be back uh, Thursday next week, so join me at eight o'clock. Also, we have our Tuesday night free reading series. That's the first Tuesday of every month. So check out all of these programs and more on our website, therhino.org.
org. Make a donation if you can to support us. But more than anything, thank you for being with me tonight. You were a pleasure to perform for. And thanks for the sounds. They were great. Good night. Yay. Yay. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye.